today I'd like to start a study on the book of James. And James is a really good book to study because it answers one of those questions we all have, which is, how do we walk out our faith? What do we do with following Jesus? How does this faith meet our everyday life? James addresses that for us. I want you to imagine with me for a moment you're a new believer, but you're a new believer in a time where Christianity is, is kind of a new, new thing. It's less than 10 years after Christ has ascended back up into heaven. The disciples are still preaching and teaching and, and churches are starting and, and the gospel is spreading and people are starting to realize that the man they just killed was the son of God who was there to save them and the gospel spreading. And so you're a new believer in this time. The, the question on your mind, what do I do now that I follow Christ? What does this look like for me? James is going to answer that question for us in his book by saying this, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I have to stop us right there and ask yourself, when was the last time a man of God introduced himself to you and didn't say, hi, I'm Bishop this, I'm Pastor that, I'm Director of this. How many people introduce themselves and say, hey, I'm a slave of God. That's what I do. My, my, my life's not mine. I, I'm owned by someone else. I'm on, I'm on somebody else's mission. It's not a common occurrence. But we see James's dedication to his gospel cause and the way he starts his very first letter. He doesn't ascribe any merit to himself. He doesn't give himself a lofty stature. He starts his letter off and says, Discount me. Don't look at me. Look at him. He says, I'm writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. As he says that, the 12 tribes of Israel are dispersed. There's, they're, they're covering a great area. They're not all living together. The gospel is going out. It's spreading around. And he's trying to reach those people that are all out there, trying to figure out what they're going to do with their faith. How are they going to walk out this faith in Christ? He says, Greetings. Now that word might not mean to it, much to us, and, and when I first read it, I, I glossed it over. And then as I was studying and, and doing my homework to preach this, I realized that starting off a letter by saying, I'm a slave of God, James is firmly letting us know where he stands. This isn't his message. This is the gospel message. His life isn't his own. He's following orders from his master, Jesus Christ. But when he says greetings we get a hint of what's to come in the rest of his letter. And that is practical, down-to-earth application of how we follow Christ. You see, in the Jewish culture, when Jews would greet each other, they wouldn't say greetings. They would say shalom or peace. They had customs and they had ways of doing things that were very specific. And whenever someone jumped out of those customs or traditions of doing things, it would, it would jump out to someone of Jewish descent. And the way the Greeks and the Gentiles greeted each other was with a common greetings. This was like saying, what's up from the pulpit for James's day. He's not giving any kind of spiel or pre-monologue to what he's saying. He's just saying greetings. He's, he's greeting them in a practical way. Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question, and that is, have you ever been through tough times? Has life ever been hard? Of course, all of us have to say that yes. If we've lived any time on this earth, life is hard. Then as we think about those hard times, the loss of a job, financial changes, the loss of a loved one, deep tragedies, betrayal, hurt, any of those things, when we think about these hard times, do we think of them as overcomers, as, as warriors, as faith walkers? Let, let me put it to you another way. When we look at struggles in the Bible, when we see David and Goliath, we see David stride out onto a field to face a giant. He looks up at the giant and he says, my God is going to take you down today through me. We see 
disciples of Christ going and preaching to people and as the people stone them and they go to their deaths they die preaching a gospel to people these are overcomers these are people who have shown great faith as they walk out their Christian life but many times I would suggest that you and I when we hit these hard times that's not how we feel going through a hard time many times when I go through a hard time it starts out with why would God let this happen? Maybe I see a tragedy, or I get hurt by someone, or there's something terrible that I have to see working on the ambulance, a terrible situation that someone is in. And the question that hits my mind is, why would God let this happen? If he's all powerful, why would he let this happen? And this is the question the atheists ask. If there's a God, why would he let all this happen? In fact, many atheists, they're not atheists because they don't believe in God. They're atheists because they know there's a God and they're mad at him. And they're using their unbelief to try to pay out or avenge on God. To kind of show him that he can't be the boss of them because they can choose not to believe in him. And many times it's because they've looked at the world and they've seen evil and they've seen hurt and they've seen tragedy. And they ask, why would God let this happen? That question quickly morphs into... Does God even love us? Does God love me? And this taps into a deep insecurity we just have as humans as we experience what the world has, which is this cheap and fake love. It's not real. There's no deepness to it. Many of us have suffered at the hands of people who were supposed to love us. And so there's that deep insecurity. Am I loved? Does God love me? If God's letting this happen, how could he love me? Because this doesn't feel like love. And for some of us, that question will go into another one. Does God even exist? Is God even out there? The only way to head these questions off at the pass, the only way to go through trials and battles and temptations as an overcomer, is to have faith. I'd like to present to you today the idea that faith is your greatest weakness. It's the biggest hole in your armor. It's the most important thing for you to guard as a follower of Christ. And there's three people that know this greatest weakness about you. Hopefully you know it. Hopefully you know in your dark times what your heart is capable of. You know that when that accident happens, when that bill comes in, when that family member does that thing, you know that in your mind, you start questioning God. Your faith, it's, it's a weak spot. God knows faith is a weak spot. And there's somebody else, but we're going to talk about him in a little while. James starts his book off by telling us trials are coming. I told you James is a practical, down-to-earth man. He says, My brothers, consider it joy whenever you experience various trials. So the first thing we get to learn about trials from James is that the battle isn't necessarily in front of us. We're not necessarily grabbing a sword and going out on a field. The battle isn't in our relationships. The battle isn't in our work life. The battle isn't in our family. The battle isn't that loss you've experienced. The battle is in your perspective. Your perspective. Because when we get the gift of eternal life, when we get a new life from Christ, we receive things. We get a new life. We get an eternal home. We get the guidance of a Savior, the comforting of the Holy Spirit. We also get a new perspective if we're reading the Word of God. And this is one of the key places our perspective has to change because James says when these trials come, when these temptations come, instead of being tempted to be overwhelmed and question God, James challenges us to walk over to our little chalkboard, chalkboard and put down a mark for joy. He says when you see that coming, count it joy. When you see it coming, count it for joy. That's the perspective he wants us to have. James isn't speaking Christianese here. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. Have you ever known someone who speaks Christianese? And, and, and they're as plastic as a water bottle, but, but when you talk to them, they'll tell you things like, I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm walking along, and I'm doing my thing, and oh, praise the Lord. But maybe there's not anything actually backing it up. They just speak these words really well. I used to have a friend that I worked with, and if he was going through a tough time, I'd ask him how he's doing, and he'd put on a long face, and he'd say, 
I'm counting it all joy. He didn't look like he was counting it all joy. He didn't look like an overcomer. He just spoke Christianese really well. These words, there might not be any actions behind. James isn't speaking Christianese here, and I'm going to tell you something else. He's not being idealistic. James is not suggesting that when tragedy strikes or life punches us in the face, that we're just to go to the bank teller for our free lollipop and our free dog treat for our dog and then go jump rope down at the local park. James isn't being idealistic and he's not speaking Christianese. He's telling us that if we are in possession of a life-saving, Jesus-walking faith, then we have the gift of a new perspective. And when we see things that are awful, we need to count it joy. So what is joy? What am I talking about when I say joy? Because joy is not happiness. You can be counting something for joy and not feeling happy. One of my good friends that I did work in the prison with would constantly tell us that when his first wife died, he knew his joy was in the Lord because all of his happiness was gone. He said he, there was not a bit of happiness in his life, but his joy was still there. What does he mean by that joy? That joy is a state of being. Someone described joy once as faith stretched out. Joy is a state of being. It's a state of mind. Joy is a perspective. Joy is choosing to trust God when it doesn't feel like it or seem like it or look like it at all. But why? Why do we need to change our perspective? Because some of you aren't convinced yet. Some of you think that when that tragedy is assaulting all five of your senses and everything is telling you that this is a bad thing, it's a fantasy to walk over to that chalkboard and mark it down for joy. James continues on. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, but endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. James knows that our faith is our weak spot and that you and I, we aren't born with great scoops of faith added into our recipe. James says our faith has to be tried so that it can gain endurance and it needs to be tried again and it can gain more endurance and more endurance so that at some point our, Jane, our faith becomes complete. Our faith becomes mature. Faith testing results in faith endurance, which result, results in a complete faith. Now, if I were to ask any of you, do you want powerful, life-giving, Jesus-walking faith? Do you want to be an overcomer? As you face that situation, as maybe you get stoned like Stephen, do you want to go down preaching the gospel? As you walk out to face Goliath, do you want to walk out there telling people about your God? As you go into prison like Paul, do you want to go in there and sing his praises? Do you want that kind of faith? And we'd all nod and we'd say, yes, Lord, give me that faith. But then when the trials come, when the trials come for you and I, we quickly slide down into, God, why would you let this happen? God, do you love me God are you even there do you see how we just find ourselves in this place of no faith James is unlocking the code for us here James says when you see the trial coming when you see the battle coming before anything else happens count it on your scoreboard for joy why would we count it for joy because we know this is going to test our faith and that's going to create endurance and that's going to give us a maturity. And as we walk along with Christ and our faith is developed and our faith is in gaining endurance and it's matured, that when these battles come, when these temptations come, we're not going to face it like a man with little faith. No, we're going to see a big trial and our perspective is going to be changed. It starts by a little bitty habit of counting it for joy. But then when we count it for joy, man, it doesn't make sense to us. Like I said, there's been times when I've had all five of my senses assaulted with the fact that the situation I was in was absolutely no good. People are dying. People are hurting. Things are not okay. I'm questioning my life decisions. But if I can learn to count it for joy in my book, well, man, there's nobody that's going to make sense of that for me than God. I have to look to God. This is, a, this is a step of obedience that precedes our faith being built. So when we see 
that battle, that temptation coming, we walk over and we count it for joy. Then we have to say, God, help me out. I'm counting it for joy. I'm trusting you to work. I'm trusting you to fix my faith. But you have to do the work, Lord. And as we look to the Lord, as we ask him to show us what he's doing, I dare say he'll show you. You'll get to see him working out his sovereign plan. When we count it for joy, we're choosing the faith life. We're choosing the faith life that we have been given. We're changing our perspective. We're choosing God's way. And when you choose God's way, you don't walk into a trial or a temptation alone. Oh no, you walk into that battle with the Holy Spirit as your comforter, with Jesus as your companion, with God the Father as your confidence that he can work all things out for his plan, which is good, which is for redemption of humanity. I think it's very easy to see from reading the scripture that as Jesus was in the garden and he's sweating great drops of blood as he prays to the Lord, Father, please take this cup from me. Jesus was not happy. It wasn't a happy time. But I also guarantee you Jesus had joy. Jesus was considering it joy. He knew his father was working. He knew there was a master plan of redemption and love for all of humanity that was going to start with his suffering, a great suffering. But he knew there was a plan, and he counted it for joy. And Jesus had faith. He had faith because he knew. He knew his God was going to do something. And that's what James is telling us here. might not seem like it, but count it for joy. Have faith in our God. Know that he's going to do something. That's why Jesus can say, I was tempted in every way like you. I know what it's been like there for you. And you know when you go into a battle, Jesus says he sent the Holy Spirit as his comforter for us. We're going to be taken care of. Jesus is a fantastic companion because he's been tempted and tried. He's gone through suffering. And as we come through our trials and our struggles and our battles, as we take that little step of obedience, not a feeling, not an emotion, as we step, take a step of obedience and say, okay, God, I'm going to count it for joy. Watch your faith grow. Watch your faith be completed to maturity. Some of you know people in your lives that have had earth-shattering things happen to them. Just awful things. I have friends that were burned severely by the church. And they've turned away from Christianity altogether. They want nothing to do with the Bible or with Jesus or with the gospel. And they just walked away. But I also know other people. Overcomers. People of great faith. That I have seen walk through some horrible things. Down some roads that I can't imagine God could ever use for good. And I've watched them walk those roads unshaken. They've got a faith that's been matured and that's been tested. And there's an endurance in that. That faith is lacking nothing is what James says. And it's lacking nothing because it's got the full power of God. Walking with Christ, living out the gospel is not a cheap or a cheesy thing. It's not something we just say. It's not Christianese that we just kind of hypocrisize what we say and then what we do or how we feel. It's not something we're going to put on for the other people at church today. It's not idealistic. It's not a joke. Christianity it, in the gospel living starts with a little step of obedience. Say, okay, God, I trust you. Change my perspective. Give me new eyes. Let me see this in a new way. Let me count it for joy so I can have faith. The third person that knows that you and I have little faith is the devil. And you can guarantee that when those trials and those temptations come, the devil is going to be taking a store and he's going to be stabbing as much as he can in that little chink in the armor. Any place he can find, there's no faith. He's going to stab there and he's going to throw darts at it and he's going to shoot arrows at it. And the devil is going to come, come, come after your faith. James has given us the key. We start by counting it joy. What has the devil got to sling at you if when you see a battle or a temptation coming, you can boldly walk forth saying, you know what, I'm counting it joy. My God's working. My God is doing something right here. I know my God has a master plan of redemption and for good. And maybe there's some suffering involved with this, but he is a good God and he's got a plan here. I don't have to feel happy. I don't have to pretend that I'm happy. I can look at you with tears in my eyes and I can say I'm counting it for joy because my God is at work and I have full confidence in my God. 
devil has to go home. He ain't got nothing on top of that. Because if we will count it joy, if we will take this little step of obedience, our faith will be made mature and complete. And our greatest weakness can become our greatest strength. <laughs>